uh, you, it's hard to see on this projector, but this is the location on the field, and this is the 10-yard line, your own 10-yard line, and this is the um, opponent's 10-yard line. So you, you, over to the right, you're closer to scoring here. Um, so they pretty much never go for it unless they're, they're in the, in the uh, opponent's What's that called? They're part of the field, their side of the field. Um, however, if you look at it purely statistically, purely probabilistically, this is a chart that actually describes when you should go for it. It actually says that when you only have one yard to go or two yards to go, no matter where you are in the field, you should still go for it. That the net gain, the net benefit to your team is better than the risk of leaving them with the ball on the 10-yard line. You're leaving the opponent with, with the ball on your own 10-yard 10, 10 line. Now, emotionally, we can't get over that, and that's a whole other talk, a uh, cognitive biases talk that I have. So we're going to talk about how a table like this gets built, how you make decisions, or at least get informed by what the statistics tell you. You still get to make a choice, and you can either go with what the statistics tell you or not. And you might decide that based on how strong the statistics lean, and we're going to show you that as well. So this talk is about how you generate a table like this so that you can make more informed decisions. Bias eats good decisions for breakfast, though. So we are going to make decisions based on our own mental models sometimes, and, and, and they're often wrong. But by understanding these probabilistic techniques, my hope is that you'll learn to trust them more, and you'll end up making better decisions. They're actually incredibly simple. Um, I'm only a mediocre statistician. Uh, you know, more advanced statisticians can calculate this stuff in their head or, or use a formula on a page. I I'm a mediocre statistician, though. I essentially use the computer. I have a powerful computer. So a mediocre statistician with a powerful computer is just as effective, in fact, maybe even more effective than a statistician who thinks he can put a formula to it, because we can model different things. And, and they're very simple. I'm going to actually show you code, and, and, and you will completely understand that code, no matter what your level of, of technical skill is. And hopefully by doing this, the next time you have a decision to make, you'll pick up a keyboard and you'll write a little piece of code. Maybe you'll fork one of my JS fiddles that I'm going to show you and give it as a starting point for one of your own simulations. A little bit about my background. I went to Virginia Tech, graduated with an electrical engineering degree. Any Hokies in the room? Any, any Hokies? No. ACC? Any ACC? OK, we got some ACC. Hopefully not, not UVA. Any. Uh, I started my first business while I was still an undergrad at Virginia Tech. I grew it to 80 employees, 20 million a year in sales. We did factory floor automation process controls. Our biggest client was GE Power Generation. We actually wrote the controls software, designed the hardware and wrote the control software for power generation turbines. Uh, these are very uh, dangerous, safety critical coding operations because the turbine, the power generation turbine, is a generator, but it's also a motor. A generator is just a motor run in reverse, and it's hooked up to the power grid. Lots of forces acting back on the generator. It's not just pushing power onto the grid. If you tell it to do the wrong thing at the wrong, wrong moment in time, those forces will conflict. It will literally vibrate itself to death, destroy millions of dollars worth of equipment, and potentially kill people. So we got really good at the intersection of of software development and quality and safety and security. And I leveraged that reputation. I did another spin out called Qualtrics. You can't see the logo there. That was very much oriented towards decision making with data. And I leveraged that, that, that work to get a position at Carnegie Mellon reading, leading a research program. I went to Carnegie Mellon to change the way software development was done. I thought that by analyzing the data of the way it was being done, we could make much better decisions. And so I hooked up with a gentleman there by the name of Watts Humphrey. Anyone recognize the name Watts? Good. Uh, anyone recognize the capability maturity model, CMM or CMMI? More, more hands go up. So Watts invented the CMM. And Watts and I got together when I started on my PhD at, at Carnegie Mellon. And we came up with this concept of a way to reintroduce metrics back into the agile community, who had essentially thrown them out, other than velocity and burn chart. They'd essentially thrown out all, all metrics uh, because it hurt the agile transformation. So we had a different way of using metrics that complemented the qualitative insight that was more acceptable, we thought, to the agile community. 
So I gave a talk on that in 2009 at the Big Agile Conference, um, and I actually got three job offers out of that. So I stopped work on my PhD, and I left academia, and the reason I did that is that I went to a company named Rally Software, and the reason I went to Rally is because they have the data. At the university, the university doesn't have the data. If I, I could come up with all these models and all these concepts, uh, you know, nine, day, nine, uh, nine ways to Sunday, and I could never really prove them out because I didn't have access to the data to prove them out. Rally has tens of thousands of teams, hundreds of thousands of projects. It's a, it's a multi-tenant SaaS stack. So all that data is in one big database. Imagine what I could do crawling around that data. So I got a chance to do that. I actually was with Director of Analytics and Research for Rally for five years. I developed, a, the, with working with the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon, we developed this thing called the Software Development Performance Index, and we published some pretty good research on, on that. Some of you folks might have, might have read some of it. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a earth shattering, some of the findings we had. Some of it confirms what we know, or what we thought we knew. Lowering your whip is great, um, but some of it goes against what we thought we knew. So there's findings on uh, co-location that are a little surprising to some folks. If you're not completely uh, co-located, uh, you can actually outperform fully co-located teams as long as you're within the same, same time zone for some reason. And I have theories, and that other talk talks about those theories wise. So I'm no longer with Rally. I recently started with a company named AgileCraft. And again, this is a follow the data move for me. At Rally only has Rally data, but AgileCraft is a sit on top concept. So Rally, AgileCraft will mine Rally data. It will mine Jira data. It will mine uh, version one data, RTC. It'll also mine build data and uh, service record data, uh, things that are not in Rally. And so I'm expanding the scope of my research to include these, these other areas. So I'm not publishing today. I'm not, the talk today is not about new findings of crawling around in the data. It's really about how I use the data to make better decisions. And, and, and we'll get into that now. So the first concept, in fact, this is the most important slide in the whole deck. This is the most important concept in here. If you get nothing else, come away with this. Every decision you make is a forecast. You are forecasting that the alternative you chose is better than all the other alternatives. Now, you might not think you're doing a forecast, but by picking option C instead of option D or E, you are forecasting that option C is going to have the best outcome for us. So when, someone when I ask someone, well, why did you do X? And they give me this reason about all the positive things about X. I essentially filter that out and don't pay too much attention to that. The next question is the real significant one to me. What alternatives did you consider to X? What model did you use to evaluate them, and why did you reject those other alternatives? That, if they can answer that question, then I know they've made a, a good decision. It's all about considering alternatives. And there's two things you need to do when you consider alternatives. You need to have a good list of alternatives. So you need to develop a good list of alternatives. And then you need to have a model for forecasting what their outcome will be for you. That's essentially what the Software Development Performance Index was at, 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 that I developed at Rally, or is that I developed at Rally. It's a way of taking your economic context into account, taking proxy variables like throughput and responsiveness and cycle time and time and process and, and defect density and converting those into your economic models so you can say which is the most important thing that you work on. Well, a lot of those, those models are probabilistic, but a lot of the other models that we use to make decisions today, I'm recommending should be more probabilistic. The one of going forward on fourth down should be more probabilistic. And I'm gonna show, walk you through some very simple examples of how you do this. So we talked about the going forward on fourth down. The formula you use to, to, to do this, and there's actually, um, the Bellman equation is sort of the, if you wanna look up the academic uh, roots for the, the chart that I showed at the very beginning. That was actually derived from the Bellman equation. And the Bellman equation is essentially a more sophisticated form of this very simple equation. Basically, if you want to know how good something is cumulatively, 
you break it down into all the possible outcomes, and you multiply the probability of each outcome occurring times how good that outcome would be for you. It's that simple. One number times another number. And literally in my code, it's literally just that. It's one number times another number, and then I add up a bunch of these. The Bellman equation is a little more sophisticated and a little more nuanced. And I, I think it's actually flawed in the case of the, the fourth down analysis that they showed, they showed there. I think this would give you better results. Um, but let's walk through an example so you can see how you apply this. So let's say you're making a product decision. You have two strategies. You actually have two products, uh, pro projects you can invest in. Strategy one is relatively more risky but has higher payoff. We said that the worst case scenario here, a 25% likely outcome is that we won't bring in any revenue for the project. It's gonna cost us a million dollars to do the project and we won't bring in any revenue, that means we'll lose a million dollars on the project. In all likelihood, we'll probably bring in about two million. That's the likely case and that's 50% of the outcomes we think would like, likely happen that way. And then that means we'll have a net of, of, of one million. And then the best case scenario, this is what we're shooting for, this is what we're gonna to try to get to, um, it's only 25% likely, and we're, we're estimating, but we think it's going to make us $8 million in profit. And then this is a much more conservative risk profile here. We've got, uh, no matter what we do, we think we're going to bring in $2 million revenue, and it's the stuff we've always done before. It's, it's, it's just the next generation of it. We have a run rate of it. Let's just improve it a little, and, and we'll, we'll bring in at least $2 million, which will net us $1 million dollars for this project effort. We think we'll probably do better than that, but we don't think there's any chance we're gonna do much better than that. It's a pretty mature product, pretty mature market. We're not likely to, to do much better than that. So how do you decide which of these projects to do? How do you figure out which is best for your company? Well, we're gonna use that formula I just showed you in a very simplistic example. So we're gonna take the probability of the worst case scenario happening, which is 0.25, and multiply it by the value of that worst case scenario, which is a negative one, negative one million. And that gives us a negative quarter million. Positive, 50% positive million, net 0.5 million probability. 25%, 8 million gives us a net two, and the total for that is 2.25 million. That's the likely benefit to us for that outcome. Now let's do the same thing for this lower one. We only get 1.75 million. So we have two data points on a curve here now, and we see this. We know that if you have only one project to invest in, that 75% of the time, this is better than that, this is better than that. 75% of the time, project two is going to give you the best results. And only project one gives you the best results only 25% of the time, but it's much better best results. So if you're only investing in one project, you're 75% you're, you're, you're likely to be better off by going with strategy two. But you know, we now know that if you have an infinite number of projects, 2.25 is greater than 1.75. Just the roll of the dice, this, the way probability works out, this, was, this strategy will net you more money in the end if you have an infinite number of projects. Now, the, the question is, where's the trade-off point between those? Where is the dividing line between when you uh, should invest it? So if it's for my career, okay, and I only get to manage one project and I might get fired, then I'm going to take to strategy two. But if it's for the business and I've got 10 or 20 or 30 projects to invest in this year, then maybe I need to figure out which strategy is, is better. So we need to know where that cutoff point is. We're going to write a little Monte Carlo simulation that will, and I'm going to walk through the code for that, that will give us this answer of where this trade-off point is. And so um, Monte Carlo is a technique, you heard it in the keynote this morning, um, as a, a technique that's great for, for, for figuring out these probabilities. There's a gentleman by the name of Nate Silver. Anyone heard of Nate Silver? So Nate uh, was in the, the business of using uh, probabilistic models to forecast sports outcomes. He's very good at this. He decided to try his hand at politics. And in the Obama-McCain election, he actually got 49 out of 50 states right, only missed one state. He did better than all of the other pundits did that year. And then four years later, in the 
Obama Mitt Romney election, he got 50 out of 50 states. Only one other statistician actually beat him. Of course, he went to UVA, so I'm not allowed to talk about him. So, um, so here's the code for that. Oh gosh, this is awful. You guys can't read that. Mm. I'm wondering if there's anything I can do. Let's see if I can. Um, that's not even broadcasting. I did this at another conference, and I, we could read it. Okay, well, most of, a lot of you have computers, so you can go to jsfiddle.net slash lmacheroni slash j3wh61r7. You can read that if, you, if you'd like to get this. So I'll, I'll walk it through, so maybe just listen to me if you can't, if you can't read it up there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run this simulation 10,000 times. So the way Monte Carlo works is you basically say, let's try one possible outcome, and let's roll the dice at decision points in that path, and we'll walk it all the way through to the end, and we'll see uh, you know, which way it lands. And we're going to do this tens of thousands of times so we can build up a probability distribution. Um, I'm using my toolkit that I developed while I was working on my PhD called Luminize. Um, it's, it's open source. It's available. There's a, a CDN. Um, you can download it. All my JS fiddles sort of uh, hit it so you can see it. But I'm not using much out of it. And, and, and the, the tools I'm using out of it are not sophisticated uh, tools for this example. I'm just using simple things out of it. I'm using the random picker, the utils, and the table to make the output look pretty here. So random picker is the only real statistical function. And the way random picker works is you give it a distribution. And this says distribution p colon 0.25. So that's a 25% probability outcome, negative 1 million, negative 1. So I'm basically inputting that probability distribution back here. 0.25 times negative a million. I'm inputting that into the, into the, 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 pick, the picker. Uh, negative a million, 0.5, a million, 0.25, 8 million, and the same thing for the other distribution. I'm just setting up those pickers here. Now I'm going to start, this is a function that I'm going to call, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it with a different number of projects. I'm going to go from 1 to 4, and then I'm going to double after that. Uh, every, all the way up to 100, and I'm going to see where the trade-off point is, where, where strategy 1 actually starts to beat strategy 2 in terms of the number of times it wins. And this is the function, these 9 or 10 lines of code here, that do that for us, that run the simulation once. So we start with um, setting the, the wins for strategy 1 to 0, and then we say 4 i in the number of 1 to the number of iterations, that's 10,000 times, we're going to do this, which is going to be one run of the simulation. We're going to get strategy, prof strategy 1 profit and strategy 2 profit both to 0. And then we're going to do a random picker for strategy 1 and strategy 2. And we're, and, and we're going to do it times the number of projects we have. And then if strategy 1 profit total is better than strategy 2 profit total, then we're going to say strategy 1 is better, number of wins. And very simply, we walk through this, run this 10,000 times. And we'll know, we'll have a table of the number of projects you have in your company versus the, the number of times that it's likely, strategy one is likely to win. So let me ask a poll a question, uh, poll, poll you guys here and see which, where you think the trade-off point will be. How many people think it'll be a really large number like 20 or above is the trade-off point for the number of projects you need to pick the more risky strategy? Nobody thinks it's 20. How about 10 and above? OK, a few people 10. How about 5 and above? OK, that's, that's most everyone. Any fours? Four. Any threes? Any twos? Oh, a couple of twos at the extreme end. Now, we know it's not one, because with one project, 75% of the time, you win with uh, uh, the strategy two. So the table works out to be a lot lower than you think. And this is almost always true. We're always on the safe side, on the fear side of these, of these decisions. We, we, so, so the trade-off point, though, the, t of taking a risk is much lower than you think. So uh, we get the data point we expected at one project. You, you're, you're, you're worse off with strategy one than you are with strategy two. At two projects, we get pretty close to even. By the time you get to three projects in your company, you're better off taking the riskier strategy. And there wasn't even a big delta between, between those at the, at the high end. And, and I think most projects might have an upside of much bigger than, than eight million. So this is a, one example of, of how to do uh, probabilistic forecasting. Um, there's a, this is another example of doing probabilistic forecasting. Anybody recognize this? So what, what is that? 
Settlers of Catan is a game. So what do the dots on the numbers here mean? Exactly. And this spot on the board draws probability from this one, this one, and this one. So the probability of a 5 being ro rolled is, is, is a 5 in proportion to a 6, or maybe this is 5. Yeah, there's 5 dots here. It's hard to read. Uh, for an 8 being rolled, 4 dots for a 5 being rolled, and 3 dots for a 10 being rolled. That's the proportion of probability of those. Now, a 2 being rolled means you had to ro roll two dice. Both had to be a 1. So there's only one possible way to get a 2. And I can't see the 2 on here. I think it's over here. You can't tell. There's only one dot there. So it's the least likely. And this location on the board pulls from all three spots. So you'd add up the number of dots for those three things, and that would be the probability that placing a, a settlement there would likely to get a hit on any given roll, or at least proportional to all the other spots. Add up the dots. So you do this when you play strategy games. Here's the interesting thing that, that ties back to the analogy here. There's no single move you're going to make in a strategy game that's going to win it for you. The way you win strategy games is you basically take probability into account at every little decision you make. And then cumulatively, if you're on the right side of that formula over the course of a whole game, you'll win. And the people who are really good at this win consistently all the time because you get lots of chances to do this. And if you always are picking the right strategy, it adds up and you're going to be much better than the guy who's not picking the right strategy. Same thing with making decisions. But of course, emotion and bias uh, plays a part. And uh, in, in our example here, you see this negative million here. If you're the single project manager for that one, that might look bad for you. So you need to create a corporate culture. You need to be in a company that allows for that sort of failure and know up front that the high end is 8 million, but the low end is negative 1 million. And everybody needs to be okay with that. Um, also, our bias says we tend to ignore outlier numbers like that. We're not going to believe the 8 million. Well, it's true that most big successes, startups especially, are basically folks that get lucky and roll into that, into that space. And so if you want to be lucky one of those times, you're going to have to take this strategy several times in your career and roll the dice and go with the more risky one. So, but emotion, emotion uh, plays a part, and by using these techniques, hopefully we can take emotion out of it a little bit. There's also another way that this takes emotion out of it a little bit, and this is probably the second most profound thing in my talk. Um, when you're making a decision and Joe disagrees with Sally, and well, are we going to go with Joe's alternative or Sally's alternative? That, that's the wrong way to sort of have the conversation to begin with. Because when you, th then you're arguing and you're really talking about who is right. What you need to be doing is considering alternatives and decision making is just about what is right. Go into it without a personal stake. Don't ever let any of the alternatives be labeled Larry's favorite alternative. Larry doesn't have a favorite. Larry just presents the alternatives and, and looks at models of which ones will come out which way for the organization. Nobody gets angry at me. Nobody disagrees with me. Nobody argues with me in the end for that. Now, of course, that actually gets frustrating to people that have this, goal. well, the last time we did that, it worked out really badly for us. And, and so those folks are really convicted, and so they don't necessarily like the very probabilistic way of thinking. But most people, I think, respect it, and most people uh, uh, actually, you'll get along better with everyone um, uh, in general, if, if you follow that approach, if you're the guy in that room or the gal in that room taking that approach. So one of the other problems with this, and I just highlighted it actually pretty clearly, is that where did those curves come from? Where did that negative million, one million, eight million curve come from? Where did the one million, two million, two million curve come from? That came from people. People had to give us that. We couldn't we couldn't actually go get that data from any place. We had to use the qualitative insight, the expertise of the individuals. And this is the key differentiator for the, between the way I do metrics and the way metrics were done prior to the Agile transformation work. And this is the key message of my talk that I gave in that Agile 2009 conference with Watts Humphrey, is that you, you really need a, a, an approach that uses quantitative techniques to complement qualitative techniques. So you also have to get better at gathering the quantitative, the qual I'm sorry, the qualitative input. And there's a guy who's written a whole book on this, this brilliant book, um, uh, Douglas Hubbard, 
How to Measure Anything. Highly recommend it. It's a few years old now, but it's still, it's in a second edition, and it's still a great book. And, and he gives you techniques, and I'm going to give you one of them here, full credit to, to Douglas for it, on how you can improve the quality and accuracy of the input you're getting from people. So we are overconfident. When we say I'm 90% sure of this, typically we're no better than 50% likely to have that outcome actually come out. Let me repeat that. When we say we're 90% sure of something, it only comes true 50% of the time. This is the data from D Douglas Hubbard's. So that's the bad news. The good news is that we can be trained so that when we say we're 90% sure of it, we pretty much get it 90% of the time. And I'm going to give you one really simple technique that, that d does this. But before I do, I'm going to show you the curves of how effective it is. So this is the person assessed they were 90% sure of some, something, and this is, this is how they actually turned out. So the 90% number only came out uh, true about 58% of the time. So it's a little better than 50% of the time. So anything above 60% is, is basically flat. If we say we're 60% sure, or 70% sure, 80% sure, or 90% sure, without training, without calibration, it's basically just a 60% probability kind of outcome. If, they, if we were accurate, then we would, we would be along this dashed line right here. After training, you get pretty close to that dashed line. As a matter of fact, we get a little too conservative at the low end um, on, that, on that dashed line. And let me give you one of the techniques for that training, for that calibration. It's called the equivalent bet calibration. So who wants to make some money? You, you want to make some money? I'll give you $1,000. OK? Now, you don't happen to know the year that Newton published the universe. You do? Forget you. I'm not betting on you. So hey, who else wants to make some money that doesn't know the year? Don, do you know the year that, that Newton published the? No, but I know when it is. You do? So, oh, you're good, though. You're a good one. OK. So um, Don, I'm going to give you $1,000. If you can give me a range of years that you know that, you, that you're 90% sure it's within. Alternatively. I'll give you $1,000 if you just spin this wheel on the right here, and it comes up 90. Now, which of those two bets do you want? You can only have one or the other bet, but which bet would you prefer? The first one. You're very confident of that. So that's an example. He needs to narrow his range. His range is not, is not narrow enough. It's a, he's, a, he's got a 100% range. He needs to narrow that range until he thinks both bets are about equal. Now, most of you probably, uh, nine times out of ten when I do this, the person says, I want to spin the wheel. You have the same problem. You just need to increase your range so that you're not, you think both are equivalent bets. Now, the 100% range for me would have been year zero, you know, Jesus Christ, and today, right? That's 100% range. I know Newton came after Jesus. But that's about it that I'm 100% sure of. You know, I, every time I go 100 years off of that in each direction, I start to lower my confidence a little bit. Um, so what, what was the year, by the way? D Dan, do you? I'm, I'm looking up. Oh, OK. <laughs> I think I've got it here, actually, in my notes. It's 1687. There you go, 1687. So the key here is that you don't actually have to bet money, although it's, it's, it's good. You just have to pretend to bet money. So the next time you're in one of these meetings where somebody is, is doing one of these curves, say, let's just do a little exercise, everyone here. How confident are you in, are you in this, in this best-case scenario number? OK, I, I think it's 25% likely we're going to get 8 million or more. OK, so let's, let's, do the, let's do a $5 bet. If we get it. 25%, we get 50 people in the room, 15 people in the room. If we get it, you know, 25% right, then we'll, we'll, we'll go for it. And, and, and you make people think. Let's adjust the range of that. Let's adjust the, the number so we really know it's a 25% likely outcome, so that we really think the bets are equivalent, uh, the $5 for spinning the wheel or the $5 for getting it right in the end. Um, so let's, let's talk about a, a forecasting example here. And, um, it's always fun to run live code uh, on stage here, so hopefully this works. I forgot to test this over on the... How do I get it over onto that screen? There we go. Ooh, the resolution is very different. 
Let's hope it works. Okay, so um, this is live on the web right now, too. So you can, you can um, run this after the fact. Uh, I, I, my, the clicker programming I just did outside, so that, you, the, that one's not up on the web. But, so if you have a clicker, it won't work. But if your arrow keys will work walking through this simulation. Or the buttons up here will work walking through this simulation. So we're going to walk this through with a typical burn up um, data example. Oh, great. It didn't work. Actually, that's the wrong tab. Oh, I can't even see what tab to get to. That's the one on the web that doesn't have it work. Hold on, let me drag it back to my screen where I can actually read it, and I'll get to the right tab. This is the correct tab. Clicker will work. Maximize it. OK, here we go. So we have five periods, time periods, of burn up data. Very shallow slope. They started off slow. And uh, then they, got, uh, they did pretty good the second time period. They did a little worse third, fourth, fifth time period. And this is where they are right now. They're about 40% uh, of the way up this, this thing here. And there are five time periods. I don't have the tick marks on here um, for that. And this is the scope data. So they've been adding scope to the project over those five time periods as well. Thank you. Um, but they've pretty much leveled out. So, so we're going to assume that the target for the project is this line right here, that we're, that we're not going to add any more slope from this point. Now, we could have linear pr projected that to go up as well. But, but for the sake of this simulation, we're going to assume that. So the traditional way of using burn up data here would be to draw a line right through that last point with the average slope. And where that hits that line, that's when the project is likely to finish. That's the traditional way. But that's only one possible outcome. What if we had a five-sided dice? Imagine a five-sided dice. If you roll a one on that dice, that corresponds to this shallowest slope right here. If you roll a two, that corresponds to this slope. If you roll a three, that slope, a four, and a five. So let's get unlucky, and let's roll this last, let's roll a five, this last shallow slope. We're basically just extending this slope right here. We roll a five on the dice. Oh, we pick up the dice again. We roll another five. We pick up the dice 13 more times, and we roll fives every time. Holy cow, how likely is that to come out? I'm very unlucky, because that's one of the more shallow slopes. And we get this little, this, this really long projection out here, the date that might finish. And we put a little check mark. That little blue check mark just appeared there when this, when this went all the way up there. Now let's pick up the dice again. And let's roll a four. That's the steepest slope in the, in the thing. And let's get really lucky, and we'll roll a four two more times. Whoo, we're going to Vegas, man. We're, we're on a roll. This is great. Really optimistic outcome. And that's the earliest date that it's likely to come. Now let's keep picking up this dice and rolling it thousands of more times. There's one more projection. And, and you're not going to get a five every time or a four every time. You're going to get different numbers each time. And this was randomly generated as we stood here. If I go back and forward, it's a different one. And back and forward, it's a different one. So it's randomly generating a path. I don't know what the curve is going to look like in the end, but I'm trusting that probabilistically it's going to work out pretty good. So I'm going forward again, and I'm going to roll five more series there. I'm starting to build a little histogram here, aren't I? Let's go back and see if we build a different histogram. Yeah, we have a different histogram. I can try it. Is that making your eyes flicker? Is that OK? OK. So let's roll it a couple dozen times. Oh, now we can start to see a curve. Now, you can't see, but this is a light blue. You can see a, there's a light blue box here. It doesn't show up on, it's not high contrast enough. So this is a pretty, pretty much a, a close to a, a Poisson curve here. And if we run it, it took a second there. If we run it hundreds of times, we get a very smooth curve. And thousands of times would be even smoother. We built a probability distribution here. So pointy-headed manager comes to your team and says, <laughs> yeah. I need a date for when the project's going to be done. Team says, we don't know when it's going to be done. We'd love to know. If you knew, tell us. And we'd, no, no, no. We're, this is, we're agile now. or We're lean now. I, uh, the team gives the date. I don't give the dates anymore. And um, it's like, oh, OK. Team gives it. Great, yeah. So well, we have lots of dates for you. We have this, this curve right here for you. 
He's like, well, what, what am I supposed to do with that? I, I don't know how to read that curve. You know, well, how much risk can you bear? Hmm, I'm the pointy-headed manager. I can bear no risk. So, <laughs> so that's this date right out here. How do you like that one? <laughs> well, I don't like that date. Maybe, maybe I could bear some risk, but you know, marketing is going to like have a conference and they're ramping up some material and I don't, well tell you what, why don't we go to marketing together and let's figure out what the trade-offs are and what the possibilities are and how much risk they're willing to bear and, and the company is willing to bear in, the, in these circumstances and then we'll make the right decision on what to do here. Metrics to bring stakeholders and teams together, not a wedge used to whip and drive, drive between them, wedge between them and, dri and whip to drive them. This is a different way of thinking. We change the nature of the conversation using this approach to metrics. So let's, let's get a little more sophisticated with our model here, and let's go back to, to running more si si simulations. So I just started coding this about two weeks ago, and I've been pretty busy most of that time. So I didn't get very far. I, when I do this at the Agile Conference uh, in DC, I'll have 75 minutes and I'll be able to walk through a bunch more different scenarios. But I have one more sophistication that I can add to this, and then we'll talk about the other um, more enhancements we can do to this. Um, so let's start over now, except this time, let's assume we're gonna evaluate this with some risk. The team thinks that there's a 50% likelihood that the vendor is not gonna deliver on time, and that they'll be five to seven weeks late, or time periods wait, whatever the time periods are for this. So how do we do a forecast in that situation? Well, we, we just put, a, put a, roll, a roll of the dice in there that says 0.5 or below, and we're going to add another roll of the dice between five and seven time periods to, the, to that projection. We roll that once per projection, not once per time period. And so when you do that, what happens, and I skipped all the uh, running it slowly, I just ran it hundreds of times right here, you get a bimodal distribution. It's really Sad that you can't see that light blue there very well. Um, and the, the other thing you can see by showing you the projections here, you wouldn't want to show the projections in a, real, in a real product, but I'm doing it here for demonstration purposes, is that half the time you start from, uh, oh, actually, I think in this case, it's, oh, it's, that's five weeks, six weeks, five time periods, six time periods, and seven time periods delay. You start from one of these three spots 50% of the time. And then the other 50% of the time, you start from where you are right, right now. A bimodal distribution. Well, this is not very realistic. So um, what's more likely is we have lower risks, but we have more of them coming, and they each have a varying degree of impact. So let's, let's say we have a 20% risk, and it's going to have a five to seven week delay, or time period delay, and a 10% risk that's going to have a um, 10 to 14 uh, possible uh, delay. If we run that, Here's what we get. Let's run it again. I like that curve a little better. So it's hard to see that it's trimodal. <laughs> All right, what? All right, let's, do, let's do it again. There we go. That's going to be even better. I'll do it one more time. OK. You, if we ran it thousands of times and I had time to let it run, I would, we'd get the same results every time. Um, so we have the. 70% of the time, it's going to start from here. 20% of the time, it's going to start from five to seven weeks delay. This is five, six, seven. 10% of the time, it's going to start way out here. And then 0.2 times 0.1% of the time, it's going to start way out here if you get both bad things, risks happening. So this spreads out your tail tremendously. And this is what kills projects. This is what gets you in trouble. There's a lot of volume in this tail way out here. And there's a lot of likelihood that a project is going to end up out there. A 10% risk, a 20% risk. So if you're doing this analysis and you're updating those risks on a weekly basis and you're tasking people with reducing those risks or mitigating those risks, then you'll update those numbers and you'll run this simulation every, after every time period. And what you want to see is you want to see this thing get narrower and shift to the left. As you, as you get further and further along in the project. And this, this can really inform the team and really focus the team on mitigating the high-risk things early in the project. Uh, so that's the last of the simulation. Um, but I do have some more I wanted to do if I'd had time. And I will before too long. So let's discuss those real quick. And then maybe I'll get your input on how to do one of them. 
So the first point is this changes the way teams work. It changes the nature of the relationships, the nature of the conversation. It, 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 it's much less about people and opinions. It's much more about the data and the facts. You make much smarter decisions. You avoid cognitive biases much more likely in this, in this case. So a, a sophistication that's actually baked into the luminized version of this. So this was hand coded just for this presentation. But these tools are actually baked into the luminized library. Um, is to just use the last n um, slopes. Because you figured the most recent stuff is more likely to predict the future than the old stuff that were maybe three or four months ago. And, and there's a v-optimal algorithm for finding this inflection point uh, baked into Luminize. You can weight the later slopes more heavily. Uh, that's also a technique that folks use to sort of accomplish this without writing a v-optimal algorithm. I, I think this is superior to this approach. And they're not mutually exclusive, but generally you'd use one or the other here. And, and, and I, this is as far as the Luminize Toolkit goes. Uh, actually, that's not true. We have Markov chains in the Luminize to Toolkit now. So Markov chain analysis will look at the pattern. Let's say we have three time periods of very little velocity and then one time period of, of four times that, and then the three time periods and four. So the, the Markov chain analysis will actually reproduce that pattern probabilistically in the forecast. And it, it gives you different results. And, and, and it also has the tendency to weight more heavily the later information as well. So it also benefits you there. Um, then there's a whole other different kind of simulation. Um, Troy McGinnis is specialized in this. Troy McGinnis has a, a toolkit. Troy's not here this, this conference, but he usually comes to these. Um, uh, where you simulate individual work items moving through the system. You don't simulate velocity being different or throughput being, being different each time period. Um, and this, this is actually uh, more sophisticated, actually much better uh, results. One of the things that it's really good at is it allows you to do what if analysis on your whip limits and what if analysis on the capacity for the work in each of those columns. So do you add more testers to the project or do you add more developers to the project if you need to bring the data in? Well, the instinct of, of every manager out there is to add more developers. But Troy finds that when he does this analysis with people, nine times out of 10, it's not the developers that adding to actually pulls the data in. It's either the testers, or he says a lot of times it's the BA folks. It's the feeding the data, feeding the, the, the work items, the individual work items into the system uh, on a pace that the, the team can, can consume them fast. Um, remember the space shuttle visualization. Um, I didn't actually show that, so we'll skip that. We're running out of time here. Um, influencing with data. So you have this data, you have these probabilities. How do you get people to listen to you? I have this top 10 criteria for great visualization. So in a longer talk, I would actually walk through these, but I have included them in the slide deck, and they're up here for, for doing this. I borrow a lot from uh, Edward Tufte and Stephen Few and the Gestalt Institute of Psychology for this list. Um, so some of them are actually word for word the same as Tufties. That's the credits for that. There's also The Elephant and the Rider, Jonathan Haidt, Happiness Hypothesis and Switch are two books where he talks about this. Essentially, The Elephant and the Rider, the, the rider is the logical part of your brain, and, and, and you'll do what, what the evidence says is the right thing to do, but the rider, the elephant is the emotional part of you, and you'll do what feels the most comfortable or the path that you've been on the, in the, in, uh, the most. And then the path frequently guides, guides the elephant. And so in order to get people to make the smart uh, decisions, direct the rider, give the rider this information, this evidence. But you also have to motivate the elephant and you have to shape the path. You can't just focus on the rider or you will, or you will fail. So I, I'm giving this stuff that is very much rider focused, but you still have to deal with the, the elephant aspects of this. Um, you can also go too far with measurement or go down the wrong path with measurement, and you can actually commit some sins. And this was actually the original content that, that, that uh, Watts and I came up with and presented. Um, the idea here is that if you, if you use measurement wrong, you'll hurt your agile transformation, you'll hurt your ability to get more lean, um, and you, so you want to do measurement in the right way that brings people together instead of divides them apart. And I'll give you a quick example. How much time do I have? Oh, I'm at, I'm at time now, so I, I'll, I'll wrap it up. I won't give you the example now there. Um, so I'll wrap it up here. A um, little bit of credit to who paid for me to come down here. Uh, I work for AgileCraft. You can contact me there for questions answered or my Twitter handle for questions answered. Um, and I can get you the details on the, those two other pieces of content that I mentioned. Uh, or we could even schedule a demo. So the great thing about AgileCraft is that if you have some teams that are doing JIRA and some that are doing Rally and some that are doing 
uh, RTC, we can sit on top of that and give you road mapping and portfolio management and project management and metrics and visualization rolled up from all those different team tools simultaneously. Now I'll end with a bit of drama and let you guys go to lunch. They say, nobody knows what's going to happen next. Not on a freeway, not on an airplane, not inside our own bodies, and certainly not on a racetrack with 40 other infantile egomaniacs. They say trying to predict the future is like trying to drive down a country road at night with no lights while looking out the back window. That sounds like a lot of fun, huh? They say never make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> they get it all wrong. You are making predictions. You are making forecasts. Every time you make a decision, you are forecasting that the alternative you chose is going to have better outcomes than the other alternatives. You're doing it now, whether you want to admit it or not. You may as well get better at doing it. So that last quote there is from a baseball player, uh, Casey Stengel, um, but it sounds like another ba something another baseball player might Anyone know who I'm hinting at here? Yogi Berra. So Yogi Berra did not say this. Just Casey Stengel said this. But Yogi Berra said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. And that's exactly my point is that you are making these decisions. Let's just get more methodical about the way we do them. Thank you.